this I know. God has truly been good to me. Amen. Give God praise again for being God all by himself. Amen. Certainly we thank God again for this day. We thank God again for our music ministry, our ushers at the floor, our sound, our uh, nurses, our greeters, and we thank God for each and every one of you. Why don't we give God another great praise today for he is worthy. Amen. He is worthy. He is worthy. We're glad to be in the house today uh, again as he, we celebrate his goodness, his mercy. We're thankful that we can celebrate his word as well. And this word today is coming out of the book of Acts. That's chapter 6. Uh, the book of Acts, chapter 6, and we'll be reading the, uh, starting in the 8th verse of Acts, chapter 6, and verse number 8, it will be the New Living Translation of Acts, chapter 6, and verse number 8 is where we're going to dwell today uh, in this word, and if you are able, you may stand, if you would like to stand, you may stand, and again, let us look at this word together coming out of the book of Acts, the sixth chapter, and starting in the eighth verse. Here's the word of the Lord. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs amongst the people. But one day, some men from synagogue of free slaves, as it was called, started to debate with, with Stephen. They were Jews from Serene and uh, Alexandria and Cecilia and the providence of Asia. None, none of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, We heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This roused the people, the elders, and the teachers of religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. The lying witnesses said, This man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the land, uh, the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. And at this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. Drop down to uh, chapter number 7 of Acts and verse number 57. That's Acts 7 and 57, and you'll see these words. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at Stephen and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. And, and as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Final verse 60, he fell to his knees and shouting, Lord, don't charge this with this sin. And with that, he died. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And today, we're going to talk about this topic, being a real Christian can get you stoned. Being a real Christian can get you stoned. Being a real Christian can get you stoned. Would you bow your heads with me? God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love, and we thank you, God, as we come at this preaching moment. We ask, God, that you will continue to have your way with us, God, because we definitely need a word from you. Now, God, hide this preacher behind your cross. You be elevated. You be magnified, God, and you sit me down. Now, God, bless us as we go forward. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and let all the saints of God say amen. amen. I want to start with a question today, and that question simply is, what is a real Christian or who is a real Christian? Let me tell you, first of all, what a real Christian is not. A real Christian is not someone who lives life on a bed of roses that is, filled, that is filled with sunshine, happiness every day. A real Christian is not someone whose life is only filled with blessings, prosperity, and successes. 
A real Christian is, is not someone who has no problems, no concerns, no issues, or no struggles. A real Christian is not someone who has seen all their prayers answered and has never been sick or has never been disappointed or has never been rejected. If you know somebody like that who claims to be a Christian, they're pretending never to have a problem or never to have an issue or never to have a setback, I want you to know that's not a real Christian. Can I get an amen? I'll tell you, that is a fake Christian. That is a pretender. And let me tell you what, we got some pretenders in the church. Can I get some amen? We got some fake believers in the church. And maybe the church and the pastors in America has caused some of this confusion of what a real Christian is. See, I want you to know that if prosperity is the only word preached in the, in the pulpit, there are going to be some false images of what a real Christian is. If there's only being taught uh, uh, success and feeling good, uh, I want you to know there's going to be a false image of what a real Christian is. And if you hear, and I know that we've grabbed hold of some of these uh, images because I've heard that the way we kind of express things, we'll say things like, fake it until you make it. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, name it until you claim it. That's Americanized Christian Christianity. But the biblical uh, account of Christianity is very clear because I think it tells us that uh, every real Christian will experience some rain, rainy days and some cloudy days, some tough days and some troubled days and some bad days. As a matter of fact, I like the way Job says that a man that's born of a woman a few days is what? Full of trouble. Matthew 5 and 45 says uh, that the Father who is in heaven who makes the Son to shine on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. He even says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for a light affliction, which is for a moment, but it worketh unto an exceedingly weight of glory. So I'm trying to tell somebody here that as a real Christian should never be surprised. Can I get an amen in the house? Don't ever be surprised when trouble and when afflictions and trials and struggles come up in your life. Because they're going to come up because they got to understand there's a different agenda that we work in the kingdom of God than, we, than they work in the world. Can I get some help here? The world's priorities are different. The principles of the world are different than God's principles. Well, preacher, how can you, how can you uh, explain that? Well, Ephesians 2, 2 says, there was a time when we walked according to the course of this world. I wish I had some help in the house. There's a time when we walked according to the principles of the powers of the air, and we were children of disobedience. Amen. And then I want you to know the devil uh, agenda is different than God's agenda. The devil's priorities and principles are different than God's principles. And we can see that here because First Peter says, be sober and be vigilant because the adversary, the devil, amen, is roaming around, walking around and seeking what? Whom he might devour. I want you to know your agenda, your agenda and your priorities and your principles are different than God's principles. He says in Romans 8 and 7 that the carnal mind is enmity against God. Our minds are fighting against what God wants. Can I get some help in the house here today? And real Christians ought to understand that there's a tension going on. I can't get no help here. There's a tension uh, between uh, the world and God. God, the devil and God and flesh and God. And I think real Christians need to understand that that tension comes when we have to make a decision. Can I get somebody in the house? When we got to make a decision, are we going to trust God? Are we going to live for God? Or are we going to turn our backs on God? Amen. Will you tell the truth and not tell a lie to save your own skin? Will you be true to your marriage or will you uh, 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 tip out or tap, uh, tip out? Will you be a Christian or or will you just act a fool? I can't get no help here. Will you obey God or will you follow your friends in sin? What I believe the Lord Jesus tells us this way, he says, uh, I, I want to tell you there's some tension going on that's going to have to happen because there's a difference in the way I think and the way the world thinks. Amen. And Jesus says in Matthew 10 and 34, think not that I have come to send peace on earth. What? What you saying, Jesus? No, he says, I came not to send uh, peace, but I came to send a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law 
law against a mother-in-law and a man's foe shall be of their own household. And he that loveth his father and mother more than me is not worthy. Uh, he is, if he don't take up his cross and follow me, he is what? Not worthy. And I came to tell somebody here today, Stephen wanted to talk to us. Anybody want to hear from Stephen? Any, anybody want to hear from Stephen? He's going to try to get some things right in our minds because we've got to understand tension can cause us to be stoned. Amen. Tension can cause us to be persecuted and can lose some friends. But anybody say, I'm going to go all the way here today. I came to let the devil know I ain't scared. Amen. I came to let the people know I'm not scared, but I'm living for the Lord. And I believe this first, uh, uh, this first thing that we'll learn from Stephen uh, is, is right here. It says real Christians must be full of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say full of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse number 8. It says, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, none of them could stand against his wisdom and his spirit uh, was when he spoke. In other words, Stephen was a man filled with the Holy Spirit. What? How do we know he was filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, go back and look at Stephen's resume. This is not the first time we see Stephen because in Acts 6 and 5, it says when the apostles needed to find somebody to, to, to wait on tables, they began to look a amongst themselves and it says in uh, verse number uh, Acts 6 and 5 and they chose Stephen a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit amen so this man was chosen because he was a he became a deacon and he was responsible for serving tables but can I tell you right now Stephen was not only a deacon do you know you're just not only a member do you know that we are not only just here as believers, but now the thing about Stephen, not only was he a deacon, but he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, I know I got to go somewhere here. He was a, and he became a Holy Ghost witness. Amen. Uh, 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 and so how do we know that that's what Stephen happened to Stephen? Well, Stephen might have been there, was there when Jesus said, you shall receive power and the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you're going to be a witness to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And Stephen was there when the day of Pentecost came, it fell upon all of the people. And suddenly they heard a sound from heaven that would sound like a rushing, rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house and the Holy Spirit sat upon them. But what I like about Stephen, Stephen after he had that great ex uh, worship experience, he didn't go home and sit at his comfort table and look at the TV all week long or go to his workplace. But I believe Stephen did something different. Stephen opened himself for the moving of the Holy Spirit. All right. Uh, I preach what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you that you have to open yourself up for the Holy Spirit to be, uh, to be used in you. Uh, it's not just coming to church and having a spiritual experience. The question is, what you going to do when you get home? Amen. What you going to do when you get on that job tomorrow? What you going to do when you got to deal with that supervisor who is on your back? Amen. What you going to do with that wife who's ready to cuss you out? I can't get no help here today, but I need you to know that is when the Holy Spirit has to begin to take its shape and its form. And so Stephen allowed the Holy Spirit to work inside of him, and Stephen became a man of power, of grace, and wisdom, and boldness. And I believe that that's what the Lord is trying to tell us. If you really want to be a real Christian, you got to open yourself up to let the Holy Spirit uh, take its shape and its form in you. You have to understand, that's why we're fasting and praying, God, we need more of your Holy Spirit. Amen. I know I got some different other things going on. I know I got some stuff going on in my family. I know I got some things going on in my job, but what I need is more of your Holy Spirit. God, I tried to do it on my own. I tried my own ideas. I even went to my friends, and my friends couldn't help me, because what I really need, I can't get nobody in the house to say amen, what I really need is to have the feeling of your Holy Spirit, because when your Holy Spirit comes, it gives me power. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't do nothing without power from the Almighty God. And so I'm glad to know that, uh, and, and so ain't no sense in you calling on the name of the Lord and asking for the Holy Spirit if you're going to sit down and just, and if you're not going to do anything, amen. If you're going to sit back and relax, let me tell you something, you don't need the Holy Spirit, amen. If you're not, if you're going to settle with the status quo, if you're going to continue to moan and groan and complain, what in the world you need the Holy Spirit for? But the Holy Spirit want to come to some people who can be say to, say to themselves and say to their situation, that's what, I'm going to 
want to be a witness, amen, because I know I got some power because the Holy Spirit is upon me. And when I go to my job, I got power. When I go to my house, I got power. When I go to the community, I got power. And preacher, who are you going, who are you going to, who are you going to uh, uh, declare that you got power? What am I going to declare that problem, amen, that problem? I need that problem to know I'm declaring that by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you don't have any dominion over me uh, because I understand that if I got a problem, I can go ahead and thank God because weeping may endure for a night, uh, but the, the, pro, the solution, I can't get no help here, if weeping may endure for the night, but the place where I'm going is going to come up in the morning. Weeping may endure for a night, but when I wake up, I'm going to know what I'm going to deal with that situation. Weeping may be coming in the night, but joy cometh in the morning. And so I don't have to, I can, I can, I can, I, I can witness to that financial lack. Lack, you got to get out of here. Amen. Because I understand that my authority comes from Philippians 4, 9. But God shall supply all of my needs according to what? His riches and glory. Sickness, you, I can tell you right now, in the power of the, the spirit that lives on the inside of me, I've got the authority to let you know that the Lord sent his word to heal me. Amen. So I'm not worried about what uh, may be happening and even if I got a witness to de depression I know we got some people in the house here you look really nice but on the inside we will really could tell your story if your mind begin to go ahead and talk out loud amen we'll find that some people here that are down low amen they know something that happened before they got to the church today and they got some depression but can I tell some people you better declare and witness to that depression depression you cannot bother me because I'm filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and because I know I'm filled with the power of the Holy Spirit many of the afflictions of the righteous but God shall, I can't get nobody out God will deliver me from them all and so that's how we can have a be a witness be a Holy Ghost filled witness and I believe that's another thing that the lesson teaches us that real Christians can use can be used to perform miracles and signs it's right here in verse number 8. I'm not making anything up. It's right here. Stephen, a man full of the holy, the, the God's grace and power, performed amazing, amazing miracles and signs among the people. Now, can I just go to the record and say God still used real Christians? Amen. Amen. To perform great miracles and signs among the people. Well, wait, wait, wait. Preacher. Well, first of all, let me tell you what I'm saying. People still need miracles. I wonder if there's anybody in the house today that really needs a miracle and you because you know a miracle is when you can't go further any further you got you need God to step in there's nothing that you can you between a rock and a hard place you really you really need to see the power of God show up in your life and I need you to know today that miracles yes God can can use can perform miracles in many ways he can perform miracles through the doctors we know that through the hospitals we know that even through bankers and through friends they can bless you God can use anything and anybody to bless you but I, what about those miracles we saw in the Bible amen when God said listen right here on the spot he said that he said that the blind bodies mayors you are healed uh, to the woman who had the issue of blood she he stopped her blood right there there the leopard who uh, and the deaf and dumb the Lord spoke to her and so my question is now uh, we know God hasn't changed can I get some amens in the house well amen we know that there's still a need anybody know there's still a need for miracles uh, a miracle in your house a miracle with your spouse a miracle where uh, we know that we still need miracles and we know God hasn't changed he's the same yesterday today and forever he says in Malachi God does not change amen well if we still need a miracle and God hasn't changed and that means that we must have changed amen we don't have belief like we used to have amen we don't have the belief like like God, because God can do something, but he can't do nothing in an environment that is not lined up with him. I, I can't get nobody in the house. Well, let me just tell you what I'm trying to say, because I like what he says in Mark 6 and 2. He says, when the, the Sabbath had come, Jesus went to his hometown, to the synagogue, and he began to, uh, they began to hear him, and they were acknowledged. They said, where did this man get these things? What is his wisdom that he's given? Uh, uh, how can he do these mighty works? Isn't he the, the carpenter? Isn't he the 
son of Mary? Isn't he the brother of James and Jose and Judah? And, it's, and they began, aren't we, don't we know his sisters? And they became offended with Jesus. And Jesus said, a prophet is not honored except in his own country. In verse number five, it says he could not do any, any mighty works. Can I get somebody in the house to say amen? He said, I could not do any mighty works. Well, I, can I help somebody here today? The reason that we're fasting, the reason that we're praying, if we want to get every all of self out of the way, can I? Anybody know what I'm talking about? We're trying to get all of our stuff out of the way because God said, unless you empty yourself, I can't get. Can I come on here? Unless you, unless you empty yourself and you begin to really know that God is your only, I can't get no how he he ain't just one, but he's your only. I, he's your only solution. He is the only one that can get you up in the morning and you got your mind in your right mind. Amen. He's he. I'm down to the point where I need him now and I ain't playing church no more I ain't playing religion anymore but I'm at a place where I need the Lord and I need him to show up I need him to show up and let him know but Lord I want you to know in this fasting and prayer season we, we believe you we, we trust you and we want to see you use us to do and do mighty works amen as it was done in the biblical days and then there's another lesson that we get here. Real Christians must accept new re 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 revelation, I'm sorry, new revelation of God and change accordingly. A real Christian must accept the new revelation of God. Verse number nine, it says, And one day some of the men from the synagogue of the free slaves came to Stephen to begin to debate with him. They debated with him. They stood. They tried to stand against him, but they couldn't stand against Stephen because he was full of wisdom and the spirit of the Lord. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen. And they, they lied and they began to get the religious leaders to arouse. And they arrested Stephen. Look at they, they arrested him. And they brought him between, before the high priest. And they said, the lying witnesses uh, began to say that this man has been speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. He has been speaking about Jesus of Nazareth. He was going to destroy the temple. If you go on down to the uh, ch uh, chapter number 7 of Acts, we see now that finally they asked Stephen, what do you have to say about these things? And I'm glad to know I found out that uh, Steph Stephen wasn't just a man filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. He wasn't just a man that was a deacon. Amen. But guess what? When, when, when Stephen stepped up, we found out that he was a preacher too. Amen. And you can read his, you can read his message. You go, I can read Acts number 7. And so when, when, when Stephen came up, he began to talk about uh, how the, the history of the Israelites. He went from Abraham and finished up with Jesus. But the high priest and the, and the Jewish leaders did not want to receive any good revelation from God. They didn't, they didn't want anything new. They didn't want anything that was going to blow their minds. They thought they had Jesus in a box. I can't get no help here. They thought they already had every revelation of Jesus that they really needed. And so and when Stephen stood up, he said, there are three reasons that, Steph, uh, uh, that Stephen uh, uh, was going to be stoned. Number one, they said that he, the, the, he spoke about the law of Moses. And he supposedly said that that, that uh, he preached about Jesus breaking the law of Moses, but Stephen didn't say that. He said Jesus was the fulfillment of the law of Moses. Then they said that he talked about the temple, that Jesus would, would tear down the temple, but what he didn't understand that you got to understand that Jesus says that God cannot live in a, in a, in a place, in a church. Amen. He's too powerful. His, his, his uh, footstool is the heavens and the earth. And so what God now, Jesus has come, and he don't want to just live in a church by himself, but he want to live in the hearts of the people. He wants he want to understand that the, you are the temple of God. He said, that's new revelation. God's trying to get us from being having him in heaven and bring him right up in here. Can I get some help here? And that's why he says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may find help, what? In a time of need. Well, the other problem they had was the fact that they said Jesus, they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. And, and, and Stephen told them, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. But here's what I'm trying to tell somebody. Unless you take this word and you make this word become a new revelation for you and you begin to say I'm going to change my mind on some stuff that I thought I had figured out. I understand that there's a new revelation Jesus is doing and when Jesus come now I tell you what everything is new and so all I need to do is say God I'm going to change and I'm going to line up with what the Lord Jesus said and if you do that you'll be fine. And then he comes back again and I think the next thing that I that I see in lesson number four, he says real Christians are in good company with others who have been stoned or rejected. 
And look at this verse number seven. He says, but our ancestors refused to listen to Moses and they rejected him and they wanted to return to Egypt. As Stephen would begin to preach about all the prophets of God, they found out that there were a lot of people who had been stoned and rejected because the people just didn't want to hear the new revelation. The new revelation is Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. Yeah, Jesus comes to fix everything. I'm glad to know that I don't, we don't have to be uh, fixed on every letter of the law. If you live like Jesus, you're going to automatically obey the law. I don't have to be uh, all tied up and bring a sacrifice to the temple because Jesus has been my number one sacrifice. Amen. But he says, and I like this because he says, I want real uh, Christians to understand that no matter what you go through, brothers and sisters, you never go through by yourself. You're, you're never alone because before you came some other people. Amen. And so I don't care what trouble you have. You ain't going through trouble on your own. If you are being rejected because of your belief, you ain't been doing that on your own. Amen. Because some people have already come forward and they have already had to go through what we are going through. Can I go ahead and tell you you in good company? Somebody say I'm in good company. Because Job was persecuted and was told by his wife to curse God and die. Joseph was uh, persecuted by his brothers and sold into slavery. Moses was rejected by the Israelites and they threatened to, to stone uh, Moses and go back to Egypt. Jeremiah was persecuted and blamed God for setting him up. Daniel was persecuted and thrown in a lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was persecuted and thrown in a fiery furnace. John the Baptist uh, was persecuted and they put his head on a, on a, on a charger. Stephen and Stephen was persecuted and stoned to death. Now, all of these people were persecuted. And don't you think as soon as you get a, a, a bad toe ache, you crying and you moaning and you groaning? Uh, don't you know that there's power in the, in the Lord? The Lord said, listen, you're not the only one that has gone through something. And so people don't like you because you might be on a job and you're trying to be holy. Don't worry about it because other people have been persecuted. Your friends don't like you because you're standing up for the word of God. Don't worry about it because guess what? Some others have been persecuted. And so you're in good company. Company. Can I tell you somebody else that's been persecuted? Jesus the Christ. Amen. Anybody know Jesus came down 40 and two generations. Amen. And he knew we needed some help. And even though the person, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees kept throwing stones at him, but he says, I'm going all the way. Amen. And I'm glad he went all the way huh? because he knew there were going to be some sinful people at Old Grove Baptist Church. Amen. On March 1, 2020, huh? that would need to know that the blood of Jesus uh, it still works uh, the blood of Jesus uh, it covers all of my sins uh, and I'm glad to know uh, that Jesus says I'm going all the way uh, you might stone me but that's alright uh, you might put me down but that's alright and yeah they hung him on the cross uh, you know the story uh, they nailed his hands uh, and they nailed his feet uh, and they pierced him in his side uh, and he died uh, but can I tell you some good news uh, because I need somebody to know uh, that when the Lord Jesus uh, when he died it wasn't the end of the story uh, but so early uh, somebody say early uh, early one Sunday morning uh, he got up with all uh, all power and I'm glad that I'm here today uh, to celebrate his power and so my final point is that real, real Christians, when you're stoned, you need to know the chief cornerstone will give them the victory, will give you the victory. Acts 7 and 54, the Jewish leaders were inf infuriated with Stephen. They shook their fists at Stephen. But look at verse number 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, glanced steadily in the heavens and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at the right hand. When I read that, I thought about that and I say, they saw Jesus standing. Because everywhere else in the text, when I read about Jesus in heaven, he's sitting. Oh, like, uh, Colossians 3 and 1 says, if you uh, then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, which Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Hebrews 1 and 3 says, Jesus sat down on the right hand of the mighty on high. Hebrews 12 and 2 says, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who sat down at the right hand of the throne. 
Revelation 5 and 1 says, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne. I want you to know, well, why in the world would Jesus be standing? Because Stephen now needs to know that there's, a, there's power greater than him. And I believe Jesus wanted to make sure that Stephen knows that I'm standing because I need you to know uh, that I'm paying attention. Uh, I know what they're doing. Uh, I know what they're saying. Uh, I know what thrones have been thrones have been thrown at you uh, but I need you to know uh, that when I'm standing I see you uh, and not only do I see you but you see me uh, and that's what I'm trying to tell you when you're stoned uh, keep your eye uh, on Jesus uh, somebody say keep your eye uh, on Jesus uh, yeah they will stone you yeah they will talk about you yeah they may call you everything uh, but a child of God uh, but I dare you to do anything like that uh, because I'll look up in heaven uh, and I'll see him standing uh, and I know when he's standing uh, he knows all about me uh, he knows all about my troubles uh, he knows all about my valleys uh, he knows all about the things uh, that's going wrong in my body uh, but I'm going to stand uh, because Jesus stood uh, he says I got you uh, in the palm of my hand uh, and nothing uh, can stand separate you uh, from the love of God uh, nothing uh, somebody say nothing somebody say nothing somebody say nothing uh, shall uh, separate me uh, from the love uh, can tribulation do it no uh, can death do it no uh, can trouble do it no uh, can persecution do it no uh, I'm persuaded uh, I need some persuaded people in the house uh, I'm persuaded uh, because Jesus is standing. Uh, he's watching me right now. Uh, I'm persuaded uh, that nothing. Nothing. But let me just tie this up. So he says it's the chief cornerstone. Let me just finish this up. Because in the chief cornerstone, I got to introduce who that is. And you're looking at 1 Peter 2. And he says there's a living stone rejected by men but chosen. And he says as now we are living stones. And I need you to know, he says, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. And this chief cornerstone has now set me free. And guess what? He has given me something new. I am now of a chosen generation. I'm now of a royal priesthood. I'm now of a holy nation. Now I know who I am. Go ahead and give God praise. I'm done. Amen. If you're here today, you need to know this Lord Jesus. Why is this preaching jumping up and down? Why is he moving around like he's moving? I just want to convince somebody that you can do better. That's all. You can do better when you understand that if you're a real Christian, you're going to be stoned. We ain't living in heaven yet. We're still on, on earth. And as long as we're on earth, we got some stuff to deal with. Well, let me tell you what. You're going to deal with it on your own if you trust the Lord Jesus. And that's my message. Trust him. A preacher, how God trust him? First thing you do is say, I need you, Lord. I need a relationship with you. If you are in that category, you haven't been baptized, you haven't said yes to the Lord, really, really, it's time now to get it right with the Lord. If you're looking for a church home and you may not have a church, we invite you to come to Oak Grove Baptist Church. It's, uh, we call it, we're opening the doors of the church now. So if you're here, you are in need of the Lord if you need someone to walk with you, someone to be with you in the midnight hour and let you know that I've got this, all you got to do is live for me. I want you to know that it's your time now. Everybody, please stand all over the building. If you're here today, we invite you to please come just as you 